Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about measles. Measles is an acute respiratory disease. It begins with a high fever, then it comes a rash. It's very contagious, can lead to death. And we have a vaccine available. Measles, also called rubiola or the red measles or the English measles, is not the same thing as the German measles. It was differentiated originally from smallpox and chickenpox about 800, 900 AD. Now, when it first hits a community, it's devastating disease. If we go back to the 1500s, when it first arrived in Cuba, it killed two-thirds of the total population of the island. In Honduras, it killed half of the population. In Mexico, major devastation. And between 1855 and 2005, this virus was responsible for about 200 million deaths. Significant. In the pre-vaccine era, more than 90% of people were infected by the time they were 10 years old. Now, unlike some of the other viruses that can be asymptomatic, if you get the measles, you will have symptoms. If you get the Epstein-Barr virus, if you get hepatitis virus, oftentimes you don't have any kind of symptoms. Now, how bad was it in the United States prior to the time when we had the vaccine available? Well, prior to the vaccine arriving in 1963, there were reported 550,000 cases each year, but the actual number, because most cases are not reported, the actual number of cases in the United States was between 3 million and 4 million. And that led to about 48,000 hospitalizations, 1,000 people were disabled because of the chronic disability from the acute encephalitis associated with measles, and about 500 deaths were reported worldwide currently there are about 20 million infections each year with about 90,000 deaths. Now that's a heck of a lot better than we did relatively recently. In 1980, there were about two and a half million deaths throughout the world because of measles. In 1990, that dropped to about 500,000. And in 2000, it dropped to about 150,000 because of widespread use throughout the world, even in underdeveloped areas of the vaccine. And because of the vaccine, we've been able to almost completely eradicate the illness. In fact, in the year 2000, measles was officially declared eliminated from the United States. But now, unfortunately, you can see that we have, as a result of people objecting to the vaccine, they object because of religious reasons, personal reasons, philosophic reasons, other reasons. They don't have their children vaccinated. Now we have an increased number of cases. So far in the first 10 weeks of 2019, there have been 300 cases in a country where we supposedly eliminated the virus completely. Well, the virus is spread through airborne route, through sneezing or coughing or breathing. If a person has the measles, and leaves a room, the virus is going to linger in the air for up to two hours afterward, and the virus is going to remain on the surfaces, like a doorknob or a refrigerator door or a light switch, for some period of time. It spread through droplets, droplets in the saliva, in the nasal mucus, even in the semen. And the likelihood is that if you're not otherwise protected, if you haven't had the virus or if you haven't had the vaccine, you've got about a 90% chance of contracting the virus on your first exposure. Now, about half of the cases in the United States result from people who go out of the country, U.S. citizens who travel out of the country, become infected and then travel back. They frequently go to places like England or France or Germany or India or the Philippines. And the rest of the cases, the other half, they're people who are incubating the virus and come into the United States, into those areas where people are unvaccinated. The incubation period is about 10 to 14 days. Typically begins with a high fever, 103, 104, even up to 105. It lasts about a week. It's accompanied by what we call are the three C's. The three C's, cough, conjunctivitis, inflammation of the first top part of the eye, and coryza. Coryza is the medical jargon for uh, cold-like symptoms, a runny nose, a head cold, and sneezing. And then we have sometimes the appearance of something known as complex spots. Those are little tiny dots in the 
buccal mucosa, the lining of the cheek inside, right around where the molars are. We have some little white dots that are surrounded by red or gray halo. They last for a couple days. They're asymptomatic, frequently unnoticed. And then afterward, we start with the rash. The rash typically begins on the back of the neck, spreads to the ears, goes to the upper torso, then to the lower torso, then to the extremities. We call it a maculopapular rash or a morbilliform rash or obviously a measles-like rash. It's generally pretty itchy. It lasts about three days to maybe a week and it seems that a person is totally recovered by about seven to ten days. So remember, it incubates for about ten to fourteen days, then you have a couple days worth of the fever, then you have the three C's, and then afterward you develop the rash and you get better. Now the treatment is basically supportive. We don't have anything specific that's going to kill the virus. We don't like aspirin because aspirin seems to be associated with the possibility of a condition that affects the brain and the liver called Rye syndrome. We rehydrate people, give them some salty food. If a person has malnutrition, it's important to make sure that they have enough vitamin A because in areas where there isn't adequate vitamin A, it might affect the eyes. We treat any bacterial super infection with antibiotics. We don't treat the measles with antibiotics. The contagious period is about four days before the rash begins to about four days after the rash appears. The severity of the infection is going to depend on you, your genetic inheritance, your environment, your health, your nutrition, a variety of factors, and also to some degree on the virus itself. It may lead to some complications, complications, for instance, like a middle ear infection or bronchopneumonia. The bronchopneumonia could either be viral or it could be bacterial. Sometimes we get a laryngotracheal bronchitis inflammation at the back of the mouth, again, the back of the throat, could be viral, could be bacterial. Some people get diarrhea. Some people go on and unfortunately suffer hearing loss that can lead to deafness. And in a small minority of people here in the United States, more so out of the country, especially in Africa, it can lead to some corneal scarring and ulceration that leads to blindness. In some people there's brain damage and in some people unfortunately there are seizures and death. One in a thousand people infected with the measles virus are going to develop acute encephalitis, the acute encephalitis might leave permanent brain damage, tends to occur about two to seven days after the appearance of the rash shows up with an altered mental state, can go on to convulsions, and in about 15% of the cases is fatal. Another kind of brain infection is the subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, SSPE, fortunately is pretty rare, one in 10,000 to one in 100,000 individuals, but unfortunately that's almost always fatal. Now, young children who are infected require hospitalization. Remember, vitamin A is very important for those people who are otherwise malnourished, and it's a standard of care, certainly in other countries, especially in Africa, where children who are diagnosed with measles are given massive doses of vitamin A initially and as a matter of fact the blindness associated with measles in places like Africa accounts for a major proportion of all preventive childhood blindness. Now if you're infected with measles it's going to impact on your immune system. It's going to decrease your immunity. So for weeks to months after the infection, you're more liable to get other kind of infections. And as a matter of fact, some recent reports suggest that for two to three years after the infection, your immune system is so impacted that you have a higher risk of dying. The higher risk of dying, especially in people who are less than age five or more than age 20, living in overly crowded conditions, people who are malnourished, people whose immune system doesn't work well, HIV, AIDS, leukemia, lymphoma, taking medicines to decrease the immunity because of a kidney transplant, woman is pregnant. In the 1920s, even here in the United States, we had a very high death rate associated with measles. Could be as high as 30% where it still is in some parts of the world. In the United States at the present time, fortunately, 
because of a variety of factors. The death rate associated with measles is only about two-tenths of one percent, but it's as high as ten percent in malnourished individuals. The virus is an RNA kind of virus, and we know that it provides long-lasting natural immunity after you're infected. We think that the immunity probably lasts a lifetime. But now the question is, what happens with newborn babies? Newborn babies from their mothers get a certain resistance. They have a certain natural immunity that they've gotten from the mother. It only lasts for about six to nine months. So if the mother's been vaccinated or the mother has had the measles, then she gives her child some degree of immunity. But if the exposure to that child is overly heavy, then unfortunately it will overwhelm the immunity and the child, even though the child has some natural immunity to the virus, can get infected. Well, we have a vaccine. The vaccine it started off in 1954 when they isolated some of the measles virus from a boy named David Edmonston. That's why we call it the Edmonston vaccine. This virus was isolated, it was adapted, it was grown in chick embryos and so far there have been many strains isolated or adapted from that that are used in different areas throughout the world. So the vaccine that you get in the United States might be a little bit different than the vaccine in some other country, but it's a live measles vaccine, a live virus vaccine, but it's attenuated, it's much weaker than the natural virus. Two doses are required, the first dose given between 12 months and 15 months of age, the second between four and six years of age. It can be used in those people who are unvaccinated and uninfected. Now here in the United States, there is no single measles vaccine available. It's complex in the same syringe with vaccines for the mumps and rubella in other countries. They also throw in the varicella or the chickenpox vaccine. The first injection is about 93% effective. The second vaccine, the second injection, well, that takes care of about 97% of the people who didn't get immune from the first vaccine. Now, up until 2008, we were only using one injection. In 2008, it was discovered that, hey, you know, there is still a significant percentage of children, very small, but a significant enough to warrant a second vaccine. At the present time, it seems that if we look throughout the entire world, about 85% of children are inoculated with the measles vaccine. One dose Will it provide long-lasting immunity? Mm, yeah, probably. <clears throat> we know that the virus or the protection with just one single injection can last for 20 to 30 years. Now, there's a lot of talk about thimerosal. There isn't any thimerosal, but it does contain a small amount of neomycin. It can be given either subcutaneously or intramuscularly. It provides basically the same kind of defense that the natural infection causes. Sometimes there are some mild side effects associated with the injection. Remember, it's a live virus. You're getting infected. So it can cause a little mild fever, maybe some swollen nodes, and some people are going to develop a transient rash. But for the most part, uh, nothing substantial happens. Occasionally, there's a little bit of joint stiffness that can last for a couple of days. But the virus, or the vaccine rather, does not cause autism. It doesn't cause Guillain-Barre syndrome. It doesn't cause inflammatory bowel disease. It doesn't cause any permanent sequelae. And it's even okay to give the virus to people or to get the virus if you happen to have a mild illness. You just don't get it if you're having a high fever or if you have some other kind of a serious disease. The side effects of the vaccine suggest that people, because it has a little bit of neomycin in it, maybe, uh, should not, if you've had a reaction to neomycin, you probably shouldn't get this particular vaccine. 
And you shouldn't get the vaccine if you happen to have severe medical disease. For instance, you have leukemia, lymphoma, or your HIV, or you're receiving high dose steroids, or you're on cancer chemotherapy. Now, the issue is, let's say you have a young child and you want to take the young child between six and 11 months out of the country. Remember, we don't start the vaccinations typically until 12 months of life. Well, if you're going to take your young child the child between six and 11 months out of the country, hey, that child should get at least one injection. And if the child's 12 months or older, should get the second injection, even though we wait typically till a child is in four to six years of age, well, we should give the second vaccine, second injection, about a month after the first injection, if you're going out of the country. Well, if a child is exposed, exposed to the measles, then if it's within the first 72 hours, it seems like the vaccine can prevent the infection. If it's after 72 hours, it's not going to prevent the infection. But we can use some immunoglobulins, and we can give a child some immunoglobulin therapy for up to six days after the exposure. Now, if there's an outbreak, we can vaccinate children typically as young as six months of age. However, if we're going to vaccinate less than one year of age, then the child still needs two injections. The next injection, 12 months of age, and then following that at four to six months of age. So why don't we typically give injections sooner they don't seem to work nearly as well in children less than a year as they do in children over a year of age. If we can get the population to a 93 and 95% vaccination rate, we get something known as herd immunity. If we get herd immunity, then fortunately, we're going to protect the rest of the community. So that's very important. We need to keep high levels of vaccination in the country in order to prevent these kind of outbreaks. Now, we were free of death from measles in the United States from 2003 until 2015. 2015, we recorded our first fatality for quite some time here in the United States. At the present time, we're currently involved in an epidemic. There are lots of people in different areas of the country, in the Midwest, in Washington, in Oregon, in New York, who are developing this. And, and part of the problem is from false information that's being spread on YouTube, on Facebook, on Google. We have the anti-vaccine movement, and unfortunately that's been traced to a false report, a report that's been known to be fraudulent and have been, has been retracted. So there is no association with autism. Then people, instead of autism, they said, well, we're overloading the system with too many vaccines for our young children. That's not the case. You can't overload the immune system with the vaccinations. And now people say they want all natural lives, especially people in the San Francisco area, in the Los Angeles area, Orange County area, some areas with 40 to 50 percent of the children who are unvaccinated due to parental beliefs. Well, that's led to Congress getting involved and, and the idea that maybe there should be certain kind of laws and exempt these, the, or make, make the exemptions not valid excuses. Mm, that's going to play out over the period of time. But remember, the threat is out there. Remember, measles as recently as the 1960s was infecting 3 million to 4 million kids a year, 48,000 hospitalization, 500 deaths in the United States, and we have a safe and a simple and a relatively inexpensive vaccine. Risk benefit? Get vaccinated. Have your children vaccinated. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.